about here? This is the entrance, the front door to 23B, our hackerspace in Fullerton, California, where we have the open access control 4.0 deployed. First thing, door is locked. <clears throat> Standard commercial uh, storefront glass door. Uh, these are what you're going to get in a lot of office parks, industrial complexes, where you might have a co working space or uh, a hacker space, something like that. Uh, we have a, this is what's called a mortise prep meaning there is a lock that's just a cylinder screwed into the door. It doesn't have like a two and three quarter inch deadbolt hole. It has a little inch and an eighth hole that you can put different kinds of locks on it. We went ahead and installed a Medico, which is a medium high security lock, relatively hard to pick. And we installed hardware from Adam's right that basically takes the normal, you know, turn it, one full turn to open your, your store in the morning uh, deadbolt into electrified hardware. So it takes a 12-volt signal that comes through. Uh, it only needs about 200 milliamps to open. It's currently locked. Well, we have a reader. It's contactless. It's the RFID readers we were looking at before, and it's behind glass, so there are no wires to tamper with. You can barely see it, just a little red LED back there. Uh, this is just a low-profile reader. Well, if I scan my wallet against it, you hear a click, and the door opens. Shut it. It's good for five seconds. It locks. So I'll go ahead and swipe this, and I'll give you a close-up of the door hardware. <clears throat> this takes the place of the standard deadbolt, and the way this thing works is kind of clever. When this thing is locked, this is basically a, it's called a dead latch, meaning it, it's more or less a deadbolt. It does not move, it sticks out an inch. When it is unlocked, something interesting happens. Uh, actually, we can just do it by this way, simulate this. When it's unlocked, this will actually, this dead latch capsizes inside the door and you can unlock it, so it does that. Very robust hardware meant for commercial use. Uh, some places, depending on how it's zoned and set up, you may need to have a handicap paddle to access it. Our, in our case, we have it always unlocked, uh, you know, when we have it open. These are also available, by the way, in two different versions, fail safe and fail secure. Things like emergency exits and fire doors always have to be fail safe, meaning if you cut the power, it's unlocked. And some jurisdictions, they'll require you to, let's say, have a relay from the fire alarm that will automatically kill power to all of your fail-safe door locks and open all the exits uh, if the fire alarm goes off. That's especially important in places like data centers where maybe it's no entry or exit, they're always locked, but it has to hard interrupt power and make them unable to be locked if a fire alarm's going off. Once we get inside, we have another kind of lock on the inside door. This is a magnetic lock. And uh, we can set this to be locked or unlocked. Uh, Ravine can help you. I'll be with you in a minute. Yes? Yeah, no worries. Pretty good. We're coming in? Awesome. Take care, guys. Oh, that's you right there. Okay. Hackerspace business, it's always happening. Uh, you can see here we have this lock here. It's a 2,000 pound magnet. It's a big electromagnet. This is an example of a fail safe. Uh, when you interrupt power to this electromagnet, you can no longer keep the store locked. Uh, we actually have a battery that gives you about 48 hours of backup to keep these locked. Uh, and they, you typically have to have something like a motion detector, a button, or both. We have both to always allow people an exit path. Uh, this reader, you notice this one is not all um, waterproof. Um, you know, this is an inside only use. But I have a keypad on here, and that unlocks that same thing. I also have a list of commands. So, you know, it goes from red, meaning it's locked, to, well, okay, there are people standing in front of us, I can't lock right now. But it goes from red to green, you know, what's unlocked. Uh, it's unlocked typically for five seconds when I, Open it, there we go, it's locked. Something else I can do that's interesting. I can say, hit command four, and that means keep all the doors unlocked. So now both the front door and the back and uh, the middle door are gonna be lock unlocked all the time until I change it again. If I do this again, I can hit five pound, and it beep five times, let me know as a knowledge, and that'll lock all the doors. Front door, this one, when people stop standing in front of it, all be locked. And I also have the ability to do something like um, only keep one of the doors unlocked, like I can do this one. 
So leave this one always unlocked, see the screen light staying on, and just lock the back door, or the front door. So I can program more commands, I can program it to turn the door chime on and off. Now there's no door chime, I can change it again. So lots of options, and it's very flexible. And the um, control, uh, the access control you have over in the kitchen? Yeah, do you want to look at that? Yeah. Let's take a look. We have one installed. One thing I'll notice, uh, that up there, that is a, an acoustic glass break sensor. That will actually, it's tuned to the frequency of breaking safety glass, or timber glass. That will tell you if the windows are breached. Uh, we also have motion detectors. Uh, the type you really want are what's called dual technology, I meaning they have both microwave and passive infrared. And those let you, those very, very rarely false. And they're very unlikely to go off from, you know, let's say a hot uh, you know, wall that you know, is hit by a heater that comes on unexpectedly and you know, rapidly warms something to body temperature. Uh, or a microwave can sometimes be false by like rain hitting the window, that kind of thing. Uh, both of those in series, they never false and they pretty much always go off when somebody actually walks through. So these are all things that are good to have. You can customize your software to tell it what's what. You may just log motion detector hits to detect if people are in the space, like for lighting and heat, uh, but not necessarily take any action on it. Uh, this is a really standard switch. It's called a uh, magnetic read switch. There's a magnet that goes over it that closes it when the door opens, the magnet leaves. This, this is what's not called. a camera. Not a camera at all. Uh, and this is a what's called a power transfer cable. So there is an electrical cable supplying 12 volts to that lock when it's open. Uh, that's a little armored cable that is flexible and lets you open and close the door. And that just transfers power through here. If this lock had been ordered from the factory with electric hardware, it would probably have hinges that have basically like motor brushes or like little slip rings or wipers that like you'd have in a motor that will transfer power through the hinges. And then there'd be a connector here or something that you'd plug into. But these don't have that, but this is an easy add-on. You can get it from any security supplier. Does the keypad also wire to the key? Yes, I'll show you how the keypad's wired. So if we go over here in our second unit, we have one of these wired up. Play case. So this one uh, we have on display, we have the other one in a little armored case from an old alarm system. Uh, one thing to note, if your space came with some kind of alarm system from ADT or somebody and it's been since ripped out and they just cut the wires, those wires are actually useful if they go to things like door sensors, motion detectors. You can reuse those, just splice them and bring them down and hook them up to the inputs of the open access. We acquired this space a while ago and we haven't wired any sensors yet for this particular one. Uh, but these are the RFID reader inputs. This is a cable. Um, I'm using a uh, six conductor security cable, but you could just as easily use uh, Cat5. That's pretty low power. And that's wired up. We have our power ground, our zero and one, our data lines. And we also have two lines that are for the LEDs and the beeper on the keypad. So we can address those through our software and change their state. You know, do a long beep if somebody enters the wrong key or enter a beep that means it was a misread key versus a key that is supposed to be locked out. Uh, and then I have a, a simple 12 volt EPS here. Uh, you can also just run off a 12 volt power supply on a computer EPS if you're in a data center or something. Lots of options. And uh, you can of course do things like, once you have you know, date and time on this clock, the Raspberry Pi actually doesn't have its own date and time uh, real time clock. So it either has to have network access to have good logging or you can have it pull the real-time clock on the open access to make sure everything's time-stamped or you have people with limited hours access, you know, eight to five or the sewing club that meets on fourth Wednesday of the month or whatever, you know, you can program that all easily. And that's kind of it, you know, installing one of these, I would expect to spend a couple hours, you know, bolting something to say like the plywood phone panel and connecting up all the bits, uh, wiring, you know, just like running Cat5, uh, it can be Cat5 or phone wire or whatever you happen to use or security cable. And then, you know, programming, you're probably going to spend an hour or two getting up and running. And then the door installation, it's the same kind of thing, any kind of home wiring and automation, it's how clean and neat you want to spend the time making it. So definitely within scope for you know, a DIY project, there's a wide variety of hardware. 
Uh, there are different companies like. Um, yeah, you can buy stuff on Amazon. eBay is a good place to find uh, lots of like commercial grade, high quality alarm and access control system stuff. Uh, as far as like door hardware for your specific door, alarm sensors. A lot of contractors will install say 100 in a school district and they had to buy you know cases of you know, 12 so they have 108. Well there'll be eight on there that were $200 new and they might be starting to bid $5. They just want to get it off their truck. So or you'll find things that are like high-end and specialized like for a, you know, a New York City rated fire door lock kit which is normally $700. Somebody who did a remodel and replaced the fire doors for a, you know, gla a elevator nice glass building that wanted architectural doors, they might kit those up and sell them for 100 bucks as used. But they're still you know, high quality rated to hundreds of thousands of cycles and fire code and all that and you can buy it used for very little from someone who you know, did a demo and was careful to save all the pieces and you know and put it in a box. So, you know, like I said, lots of options. There's a place called buyaccess.com as well. It's a great place if you need something like those security uh, cables that do power transfer or you know a HID reader to match your uh, stuff at work. Uh, Graybar and other um, Annexter, other you know places you buy networking equipment, oftentimes have that stuff as well because they cater to all types of wiring installers and contractors. And uh, you know it's not that hard to put the pieces together. It's it's no longer you know mysterious and tens of thousands of dollars. You can put something together in a space for hundreds of dollars. And does 23B have a website? Yes, shop.23b.org, and the documentation on the open access accccproducts.com. So how do I uh, end the contest, there, dude? All right. Are you done? Yeah.